Over the last few weeks, we've been exploring the subject of listening to God. And, and I want to challenge you that if you feel you've reached um, an obstacle, a place where you're stuck spiritually, you know Jesus Christ as, as Savior and Lord, you've been participating, you've been going, going to church, you've been doing um, Christian things, but you feel like there's something missing. I believe most likely it is related to this area of your life in learning to listen to God's voice and learning to have an ongoing conversation with God where you're listening to what he has to say. You're able to express your heart in a way that you know he has heard you and you sense his response, his presence, his power, his peace, and his prompting. Now, last week, I ended with a verse that oftentimes is um, not properly represented. It's not misrepresented, but it's not properly represented. Last week, I ended with Revelation chapter 3, verses 20 through 22, with a very familiar verse, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, how many of you, when you hear that verse, your mind, if you grew up in church, um, this would be an indicator, your mind instantly goes to a picture that you saw maybe in Sunday school of a, a portrait or a drawing of Jesus, and there's a door, and he's knocking, maybe it's got a little heart shape on the door, and you hear, you know, you can almost hear him knocking. How many of you, that's the picture that comes to mind? That's, that's great. And then with that, because it's, it's a good picture, with that, chances are you've heard it preached that that is a picture of God knocking on the heart of unbelievers, inviting them to come into a relationship with him. How many of you, if you're honest, that's kind of how, how you picture that verse? Yeah, that's what I thought. And that's not inaccurate, but it's not the context into which it's set. This verse is written to the church. It's written to you and I. So you need to change your mental picture that that is not Jesus knocking at the door of a heart of, a, of someone who does not yet know him. It is a picture of Jesus knocking at the door of your heart and my heart, wanting to come in and have a relationship with you, to have dinner with you, to be in a position where you truly hear his voice. Let's look at the context, because the context in Revelation chapter 3 is uh, uh, the last of a series of letters that Jesus writes to the churches in Asia who were real um, churches in existence in the first century. But they are also representative. I believe that these churches represent different types of churches all through church history. Um, they were a real one, an accurate one, but we find similarities to these churches all throughout history and today as well. And time after time, Jesus ends his letter with these words. Let he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, what he's saying is something I want you to listen to. Jesus, in giving us the last portion of Scripture, in revealing it to the Apostle John, gives us something he wants us to remember, that we're designed to hear God's voice. He speaks primarily through his word, but he also will speak through the whisper of his Holy Spirit if we are listening. So let's look at the context of, of that standing at the door and knock, and then look at it as if it's written to you and written to me. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, this is Revelation 3, verse 14, write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy gold uh, from me, refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, 
and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and the salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, I'm not going to take the time to, to show you how incredible this passage really is because everything he mentions when he talks about being blind and a salve to, to, um, to be able to see, when he talks about garments, when he talks about the water that is there, that it's, that it's lukewarm, those are all literal pictures of something that occurred in Laodicea. It was a place known for the creation or the, the production of an eye salve. It was a place that had aqueducts that was, were designed to bring cold water and hot water into Laodicea, back in the ancient world. They pumped in water um, through the aqueduct from, um, from a hot spring and from a very cold reservoir, but by the time they both reached Laodicea, it was all lukewarm, and you couldn't tell the difference between the hot water and the cold. And so he's, he's using some real illustrations to this church, but he's also describing us often. That it is easy in our spiritual life to become lukewarm, to become apathetic, not to be in rebellion, but not really to have a hunger and a thirst for God where we want to hear his voice. And if that's you today, as, as I read this afresh, I realized I was looking into a mirror. As the Lord was speaking to my heart, saying, Drew, you've lost some of that passion for me. Some of that interest in truly hearing my voice above everything else. And right now, I'm inviting you to come back. That's a beautiful picture. That Jesus is inviting us to come back. It's not a rebuke where he says um, how terrible we are, but it is an incredible invitation to come. Now, it comes with a warning in that if we continue in that state, that there can be very dire consequences to us in our relationship with him. But him standing there knocking is an invitation for you and I to take his voice incredibly seriously. Now, um, I'm going to try to explain some spiritual truth with uh, an illustration, and I don't know if it's going to work. I-, I tried it on somebody earlier in the week, and-, and it got mixed reactions. So if this fails, we'll just you know s- try to skip over it. But um, in trying to think about some really challenging concepts spiritually, uh, it helps me to have a picture. And this week, it just so happened that my faithful and trusty power book died. My power Mac gave up the ghost, as you say. It is, it is no longer operating. It is dead. Got it clear? It's dead. Okay. Now, here's where the illustration begins to come in. We'll come back to my dead MacBook in a moment. Humans are made up of three parts. We have the body, which is material. We have the soul, which includes our mind, our will, our emotions, and our conscience. And we have a spirit, the true essence of who we are, our identity. Now, outside of Christ, our body and our soul are alive. They are awakened. Our soul receives a degree of programming, or our conscience receives programming through the experiences that we have, through the things that our parents teach us, through the things that we learn in school, and and we begin to learn some understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Included in that is we have an original imprint on us of being made in the image of God. And so he places upon our conscious um, an understanding of basically what is right and wrong. But over time, in our programming, as we grow up, we're driven not so much by God's image, but by our own selfishness. We're self-programmed. And as we go through time, we learn to 
rewrite some of the original design that was placed upon us because we discover at a young age as a child that the way to get what we want sometimes is to be even more selfish, to throw a tantrum, to wear down our parents. I'm sure none of your children have ever done that. Um, a few of mine have. Okay, all of mine have. Um, more times than I wish to count, just like I did with my parents. And so that's the, the programming that we have on our own. The scripture reveals that our spirit, the truest essence of who we are, does not come alive until we trust Christ. And at that moment, he breathes life into the very spirit, the truest sense of who we are, and he fills us with the Holy Spirit. His presence comes into us, and he will use the written word to continually update our programming to rewrite all of the corrupted programming that we have in us naturally. Now, in the, in the same way, here's, here's where I'm headed with this, and this is where it may break down because all illustrations do. My MacBook died. But there is good news. In fact, there is great news. The truest essence of what it is, in other words, all the information that I really care about, is saved. Isn't that good to know? It's, it's still in existence. It's in the cloud. Isn't that cool? I mean, it sounds so heavenly. Now, if you're, a, if you're a Microsoft or a Google person, I'm not sure where you go. I'm not, I'm not sure where Google Drive is. The cloud sounds so much like heaven, doesn't it? Google Drive... A little, little less so. Not, not sure on Android. Here's, here's the spiritual truth behind my strange illustration. Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, spiritually dead, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us it, with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The spiritual reality is that when you come to Christ, who you are is absolutely secure because it is held with Christ. You can't lose it. You can't lose that identity. But then in practice, what happens is that the Lord wants to, and the spiritual word would be sanctify us. He wants to change how we live so that it matches the original design that we were created to be. And so in a very real sense, your life programming, my life programming, is updated by spending time in God's Word. Every time we spend time in God's Word, it changes us, or at least it should. And then the Holy Spirit will take our time in His Word and begin to rewrite our conscience, redirect our will, Restore the joy in our emotions and renew our mind. He changes everything about us. That's why listening to him is absolutely imperative. Otherwise, we don't have this exchange of truth flowing into our life that enables us to rightly respond to the challenges and difficulties of life. So I want to encourage you that this is incredibly important. Well, last week, uh, I, I gave you some uh, information about God's word, that the word of God and the witness of the Holy Spirit, that they work together. The word of God and the whisper of the Spirit are always in sync with each other. They will never give you different information or different direction because they come from the exact same heart the same mind, the mind of God. And so if they're not in agreement, it is not the voice of the Holy Spirit that you are hearing and you are listening to. And last week, I, I gave you a really simple exercise that I, I hope if you tried it, that you were blessed. Uh, I call it active listening, where you, you read through the scripture out loud, first of all, and then you begin to reflect on it, meditate, be still, try to, to discern what God is beginning to speak. And then as you 
Begin to discern that. You look for ways to respond. What is he calling you to do? How is he calling you to live? How is he calling you to trust? How does he want you to respond? What choices do you need to make to obey? And then, fourthly, to rest in God's promises. Because the beautiful thing about God's word is it is so interwoven with reinforcing promises and instruction that he never leaves us in despair. He continually builds us up so that we can live out the life he intends for us. And finally, to learn to rejoice in what he says. In speaking the scripture back, in praying the scripture back to the Lord, in that act of listening so you know truly what he's saying to you and it becomes a part of you. That's what he's inviting us to do. Well, today I want to move on from there in in beginning to tune our ear to hear the voice of the Spirit. I've told you um, all three of the weeks that the reason why God whispers is because he is close. He whispers because it's about an intimate relationship with him. He is already very near, and he wants to speak into your heart and life. But to hear God's whisper, we must be still and wait. Um, that's, That's the reflection part of the act of listening. And it's perhaps maybe the hardest thing for us to do. For me, personally, if I, can, if I just get very real with you, it is almost impossible humanly for me to be still. Because the moment that I sit down, I think of all the things that I should have done. And, and there's this voice of my flesh of getting things done, a performance that wants to keep me from being still. And what we have to do is we have to resist that prompting and choose to be in the presence of the Lord. I want to show you how this works from the Psalms before we get to our passage in in John. Turn, if you would, to uh, to Psalms uh, 62. This is a beautiful passage that speaks directly to this aspect of tuning in by waiting, waiting before the Lord. Psalm 62, verse 1. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. Wouldn't you like to be able to truly say that? I want to get there. I want to learn with the heart of David how to wait in silence for God alone. He says the same thing down in verse 5. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. Now, it's beautiful he's repeating that because this is what he is practicing at the moment. He has learned to be still in God's presence. And I believe this is one of the reasons why God says about David that he was a man after his own heart. Now, now think about it. David was a busy man. He was a warrior. He was a king. He had way too many wives and a whole bunch of children. Um, he, you know, he didn't do everything right. He was a busy guy. And yet the priority of his life was learning to be still in God's presence. Because stillness leads to rest. It leads to peace within us. Look what he says in verse 2. The first thing that he, he says after he is still is, He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. As he's still, in his heart, the Holy Spirit is whispering to him, reminding him that God cannot be defeated, that God is the foundation of his life that cannot be shaken no matter what circumstances come. Now, this is, this is very real when you think about the, the context in which he is often writing is one in which he is being pursued by an enemy that wants to kill him. Most of us do not have that. We simply ha- are being pursued by busyness that wants to distract us or by selfishness and sin that wants to push us away from the Lord. He's saying, I found my rest in the Lord. And the second time he waits, he says something very similar in verse 5. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. 
And it points directly to rest. Um, In verses 6 and 7, he says, He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is from God. If you're anxious, if there's a decision ahead of you that you're trying to, to wrestle with, what, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Most of the time, the way that we approach that is we begin looking desperately for answers. We'll pray And as soon as we pray, what we have a tendency to do is we'll hit the internet and we'll look for some kind of answer that provides direction for what we're trying to decide. Or we'll do the old method where we'll flip through here and we'll go, boom. O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. Well, that's not very helpful. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed. Oh, that sounds better. Okay. You know, and I flip on over. I love there, there's a great preacher joke where it said, where he said someone was doing that and they flipped it open and it said, Judas went out and hanged himself. And they flipped it, you go, ooh, that's not very good. They flipped it again and it, they landed on the verse that says, go thou and do likewise. Probably not really the best way to discern God's voice and God's spirit. Instead, we need to be still and listen to his word and rest in him. Because resting in him, waiting in him, does lead to an answer, to the answer we need most. I want to show you this in Psalm 62. Here's what David heard when he was waiting. He heard the whisper of God's voice, verses 11 and 12. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this. Remember, he says twice that he waited on the Lord, and now he's saying both times the Lord answered. Here's the answer he received. That power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. In the stillness um, before the Lord, in waiting before the Lord, David heard the whisper of the Holy Spirit remind him that God was in control no matter how the circumstances he faced looked. Secondly, He reminded him that God has a steadfast love for him. A steadfast love that is as powerful as God's strength. His steadfast love is as powerful as the force that created everything. Nothing can pull us out of that. And he was also reminded that God will reward faithfulness. That God would go before him, would guard behind him, would walk with him. And in the midst of anxiety, of trial, of difficult decisions, isn't that what we really need to hear the most? Because once we're at that point, the direction that we end up going is far less important as long as we're going with the Lord in the decision. That is incredibly powerful. So to hear God's whisper, we must be still. Secondly, to hear God's whisper, we must turn down the noise of our own flesh, our self-life, in order to hear his voice. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What he's saying is you don't have to live based upon the old selfish programming. When you are led by the Holy Spirit, he leads you to life, to freedom, to joy. The noise of the flesh always leads to sin to separation, and ultimately to death. Every form of them. If we were to look today, if we were to take the time to look at some of the categories of sin and we followed where they lead, they always lead to brokenness. Brokenness in relationships, brokenness in our own sense of peace, brokenness in our sense of purpose, of 
of worth in every area, whether it's sexual sin or religious sins or sins of our attitudes and our minds or social sins that we commit against other people, all of them lead to separation and to death. They all lead to sin because that's what our flesh is programmed to do. But the Spirit, the whisper of the Holy Spirit leads to life. That's why Galatians goes on to say, just a few verses later, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's what God's Spirit wants to speak and bring to life in you. That's why it's so important for us to be still and listen to his voice. Because in the midst of our activity, of our busyness, of our trying to do things in our own strength, we will not hear his whisper and we will not see the Holy Spirit bring these things to fruition in our life the way he intends to do. The whispers of the Holy Spirit lead to life. And if I'm lacking those, when I'm lacking love, when I'm lacking joy, when I'm lacking peace and patience, The place to begin is to go back to hear the knock of Jesus at my heart and to choose to be still. Because the Holy Spirit is a fountain of life within us that wants to continually flow, but we have to continually connect our heart and our life with him. Well, now let's let's go and look at the Holy Spirit, its work. Because what we need to do is learn how we can determine whether it's the voice of the Holy Spirit that we're hearing or some other noise that we're listening to. Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit. And and if you could really get the sense of John chapter 16, Jesus is giving us the most important message that he wants to leave us between his first coming and his return. It's a reminder that the Holy Spirit is in the heart and life of every believer, and he has a work to do, and he has a work to do not only in us, but through us. So let's read it again. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage, Jesus says, that I go away. Now in our flesh, that is hard for us to grab a hold of. Because we think, man, how cool would it have been to be like the disciples or someone in the early church to have seen Jesus in the flesh, to hear him speak. That would have been amazing. But those would have been moments in his presence, and what he promises us is something far greater, that he will dwell within us, that he is with us every moment, every day. In the same way, oftentimes, we look at the, the Old Testament saints and we, we see the mighty signs that God did to prove who he was and to show the, his people um, his heart and his character. And we think, man, wouldn't it have been cool to walk around Jericho and to see the walls come down? Wouldn't it have been amazing to have manna come from heaven every day? The whole reason why manna came from heaven every day was because they were disobedient to the Lord. He graciously provided, but it wasn't a reward for faithfulness. It was an expression of his steadfast love. Just the way he faithfully provides for me when I'm less than faithful to him. What God has given us is a far, far greater gift in the person of the Holy Spirit. So he says, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world, the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you 
the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He says that he gives us the Holy Spirit and and that the Holy Spirit is going to declare, he's going to speak right into your heart and to my heart, his will, his truth, his direction. He's going to speak to us. And what he'll use are the words of Scripture first and foremost. And then he'll show us through his voice how we are to live in accordance with those, how we're to follow him. He will guide us in living out the truth. He will convict us of sin so that the sin can be removed, not its penalty because Jesus already took care of that, but we still feel the effects of disobedience in our life and in our relationships. He will share with us the very heart of God. And he says here that it begins with conviction. The Holy Spirit brings conviction that leads to transformation. Most of the time when we hear conviction, we don't perk up and and are excited. Because conviction, when we think of conviction, you think of a prison sentence, right? I've been convicted of my sin and therefore my punishment will begin. That is not how God's conviction works. In fact, his conviction leads to freedom when we respond to it. He convicts us so that you and I can have abundant life and joy. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And what, here's what he says. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, and that sin specifically is what what is separating us from coming to faith in Christ Jesus. And it applies certainly to us first trusting him, but it goes beyond that. That's why the scripture says that whatever is not of faith is sin. What the Holy Spirit wants to do in convicting us of sin is to bring us to a fuller faith in Christ Jesus where we trust him with everything and that we don't sin too soon. That's, that is, when I look at my life and I look in, in the rear view mirror, I see so many times where I sinned too soon. Rather than waiting on the Lord, rather than trusting that he really would provide, I took things into my own hands and I sinned because I wouldn't wait. Had I waited, God would have delivered and answered in far greater ways. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin that leads us to a deeper faith in Jesus, a deeper belief that he really is the answer to every need. Secondly, he convicts of righteousness, learning to trust fully in the righteousness of Jesus and not in our own ability or good works. We need that. What keeps us humble is not the fact that we look good to others. What keeps us humble is remembering that I have nothing to bring on my own, but God has given me the full righteousness of Jesus Christ and enables me to come into his presence. And then finally, he brings a conviction of judgment. Now that is really important because why does he say he brings Conviction of judgment because the enemy is already judged. What he's telling us, what he's reminding us of is that the victory is won. When Jesus rose from the grave, it declared victory over Satan, over sin, over death. Over every enemy and obstacle you face, it was declared victorious in Christ Jesus because of his resurrection. And it is only a matter of time before the judgment is carried out. So we can rest fully in the authority of Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. He wants us to draw us in faith in Jesus so that he becomes our life. He wants to help us to learn to trust fully in the righteousness of Jesus and ultimately trust completely in the authority of Jesus. And then he gives us some specifics about how the Holy Spirit will work in your life and my life, how he will whisper to us. 
he says that he will be our guide. And we see this throughout the scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And isn't that a great promise? His promise is when you're still and you wait and you listen for the Lord and you ask him to show you his heart, his desire, he promises that he will bring an answer. And at just the right moment, at that intersection where you need to decide, do I go left or do I go right, he will provide the direction. It's part of the new covenant that we have in Jesus that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of our hearts to make his home here. Now we can grieve the Holy Spirit and when we grieve him, we will not hear his voice. But when we return to him, when we confess our sins and we come back and trust in him, we'll be able to hear and discern him speak and guide us through life's decisions. He also says that he will be our counselor. He said in John 14, verse 16, before this, he said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. We have the Holy Spirit not because we earn it, but because Jesus Christ in his gracious love chose to send the Holy Spirit to you and to me. It's his gift. His presence is an affirmation from Jesus saying, I love you. I love you so much. I want the Holy Spirit to be with you forever. Every day, every moment, I'm with you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And he comes to be a counselor. A counselor gives wisdom, gives advice on making the right decisions, provides comfort, brings insight and understanding to, to situations so that we can see them not from a human perspective, but from God's perspective. He will speak into our heart and life using primarily the information from his word, but also the prompting of the Holy Spirit to guide us and show us how we are to live. He also is our instructor. And each of these words are similar, but there's, there's some differences to them. He said, in the same thing, he said, not only will I give you the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you in John 14, 26. And this is exactly what Jesus did. After his resurrection, in the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus spent time with the disciples explaining to them how the scriptures, all the parts of the scriptures, the history, the law, the, the writings, the, the psalms, the prophets, how they all pointed to Jesus. And then after he ascended, the Holy Spirit would remind them and speak through them in those truths that they had learned. Because they had immersed themselves in God's word and they had taken it to heart, the Holy Spirit used that and that's how they spoke so powerfully. The reason why there was so much revival in the early church was because the work of the Holy Spirit was igniting the word of God within them and proclaiming its truth in powerful, powerful ways. And they relied not on their own ability. Remember, the disciples were common, for the most part, poorly educated men. And yet, God used them to turn the world upside down because they had been with Jesus and because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. He is our instructor. He will teach us the ways of God, the right attitudes, the right mindset, holy living, a pure heart, loving motivation, and how to follow Jesus in all that we do. And then finally, the Holy Spirit empowers us to bring honor to Jesus and advance his kingdom. He's invited us into his work to be a part of what he is doing. Now, I've placed in your um, sermon notes a, a little chart that helps you see the difference between conviction and condemnation. 
Condemnation is saying, yes, you are guilty, you are condemned, and your punishment needs to be carried out. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is radically different because it wants to point us to life. And so you'll see here in this little chart, I want to encourage you, when you're trying to discern, is what I'm hearing in my, in my um, heart, is this coming from the Holy Spirit? Is this the voice of the enemy? Is this the voice of my own flesh? Here are some guidelines. The Holy Spirit will always use Scripture accurately in context to give life. Satan will use Scripture as well. He did it in the temptation of Jesus. But he used it out of context and to bring death and separation. The Holy Spirit reminds us of God's holiness and goodness. Satan will simply tell you of your own worthlessness. But let me remind you how much you are worth. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price for you. You are invaluable to God. The Holy Spirit will give a sense of God consciousness. What does God think? What does God desire? Satan and our flesh always points us to self-consciousness. What do others think about me? Those two thoughts could not be farther apart. And so we need to, to look in them and discern them. And this is what we'll look at next week is how to discern the voice. Also, the Holy Spirit tends to focus in on one specific thing. When you're feeling condemnation, what happens when it's the, the condemnation of the enemy, you feel horrible about everything. Everything you've ever done is wrong. Because that's the noise he brings into our life. He compounds it over and over again. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is narrowing in on one thing because he wants us to turn around and give that to him. It always leads to life. The Holy Spirit is usually a quiet voice. The enemy is like a pounding noise in our minds. The Holy Spirit points a path to repentance and reconciliation. He corrects, he convicts, and he deals primarily with unconfessed sin in our life. Whereas the enemy wants to remind you of the sin you've already confessed and already have turned from and given to Jesus. The Holy Spirit encourages us to obey. He gives peace with a sense of confirmation because he leads to a life of balance in the Lord. And he speaks with love and with sincerity. That will help us discern the tone of the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it's something like any other learning to listen. It has to be developed in our life. So here's the challenge that I want to leave us with today. If you really want to grow in listening to the Lord, I want to encourage you to actively listen to his word, to continue to, to, to read it out loud and to respond to it. Look for the things that God wants you to rest in. Look for the things that he wants you to respond to. Look for the things he wants you to rejoice in. I want to encourage you to be intentional about learning his voice, about being still. And I want to encourage you to find a whispering spot. I don't know about you, but... Um, I have to find a place in my life, both a time and to some degree a location where I'm choosing to be still with the Lord. It helps to have a place, a whispering spot. A whispering spot comes from a, a, an interesting dynamic in architecture that especially in a, in a round room like the U.S. Capitol building there are locations in that building where you can hear a whisper from all the way across the room because of the acoustics of the room. But a whispering spot for you and I is a place where we can be still and hear God speak. It may be um, out in a park. It may be a room in your house. It may be a chair. It may be putting your headphones on and going for a walk but a place where you can allow your mind to be still and hear the voice of God, to be still and know that he is God. 
make steps that direction. I promise you, if you do, you'll discover God has a lot to say to you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord God, I pray that you would speak into our hearts. Lord Jesus, thank you for continually knocking at my own heart. And there's times when I'm stubborn and rebellious and selfish, and yet you keep calling me back to yourself. Lord, I praise you for that, for I need it. Lord, I pray for each and every person here today. Lord, would you increase their desire to hear from you, not just to seek you for your favor, but to seek your face, to want to be with you, to want you even more than they want the answer to the problem, to the difficulty, to the trial that they're facing. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, you've taught us to pray, to ask that we be filled with your Holy Spirit, not just individually, but as a church. And so Lord, I pray afresh, would you fill us as your people with your Holy Spirit? Would you tune our ears to hear your voice? Would you change the programming of our life to be, Lord, not just the, the corruption of sin, but, Lord, the revived, renewed voice of you speaking your truth in us and through us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.